Hey, Matt Edmondson, how are you? I'm okay, Fern, how are you doing? I'm good. This is, um, this is something I've been really, really looking forward to chatting to you. And I guess this is the joy of podcasting, that the unexpected happens. And also you just get to listen to stories, which I'm very much up for today. So backstory being, I've known you for, I don't even know how long. It's a long time, I think maybe. Ages. Maybe, like over 10 years. Way you over, were kind I enough, would say. Yeah, you were kind enough to let me come and do a bit on your Radio 1 show back in the day. And that bit then led to me doing Radio 1, which was incredibly exciting. So, you know, all of me is blamed on you. Oh, uh, no, all, not ev- at all. It's your everything own, I've done is because of that. <laughs> your own skill and talent. But it's it's brilliant because obviously we kind of knew each other from the TV days. And then I reckon that Radio 1 period, it could have been 15 years ago. Oh my god. 13 years ago? I don't know. Maybe yeah, maybe 13. 13. Yeah. Let's just let's 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 land on 13. But of course, before that, I knew you from from telly. Um, and you started off in TV like I did at a relatively young age. Um, what what drew you to to wanting to sort of be on TV, broadcasting? What was it that lured you in? So, I mean, I was obsessed with it from a yeah. from a very young age. And uh the thing I was obsessed with was continuity links. So that's the bits in between shows. And it's sort of the bits that I started off doing. So, you know, when someone would say, oh, that was Blue Peter, here's news round. That's what I wanted to do. Iconic. I kind of ended, I ended up doing that on CBBC for a couple of years before I kind of realized, oh, maybe my tone isn't necessarily bang on for the kids. Um, and then later with T4, which was exactly the same job, but it was, you know, that was Friends, this is another episode of Friends, so, <laughs> which is pretty much all we did. I just introduced Friends for years. So the reason I loved it was when I got home from school as a kid, that would be what I did. I'd put the TV on. And it felt like, particularly with CBBC, the presenters who were doing the continuity links, I, it felt like we were living the same lives. They were there. I was at home. We were both watching these shows. We both seemed to be enjoying these shows. They were kind of friendly faces. And so it wasn't really a thing of, I want to be a broadcaster or I want to be on telly or I want to be famous. It was just, I want to do that. What I want to do what I'm doing anyway, but in that studio. And I got really obsessed with it. You know, I wrote to all the presenters and collected autographs and really hustled from a young age. When I was like 13, I think I sent my first showreel off on VHS, very much oh. dates me, and um, got a lot of rejection letters and uh, eventually just managed to get in the door, having done an audition that was, in retrospect, mortifying. But um, but yeah, ended up, ended up doing it. And so from, from that point, I've always, I guess I've always gotten to do sort of what I wanted. The CBBC thing was interesting because, as I said, I kind of got there and did it. And I realized that I was 18 or 20 or however old I was. And I realized, oh, actually, I'm I'm doing the thing that the 10-year-old me wanted to do, but 18-year-old me actually doesn't want to do this really. It wants to do something else. And so there was a bit of a rebalance. And, and in between doing CBBC and doing Radio 1 and T4, I had a couple of really quiet years where I was basically unemployable and uh, I ran a market stall selling magic tricks. And... Um, it was, you know, an amazing, amazing experience. Weirdly, at the time, it, it felt quite, um, felt like the end. But, um, but in retrospect, it was, uh, you know, it was a, a really interesting and fulfilling way to spend my time. And then, yes, kind of slowly hustled my way back into it. And I realized that if I just sort of made things that I thought were fun or good or interesting, and someone could pay me to do it, then that was probably where I was happiest. And so I've sort of tried to spend my time since then just making stuff. And oh my goodness, I make a lot of stuff that no one ever sees or hears. Um, and or that I try and, you know, get away, maybe out of a hundred things that I think of, one of them happens. But I love them all equally. And and I I guess I became a bit obsessed with the process of making things and then seeing if I can get them out of my head and so that's sort of how I spend my spend my every waking moment now yeah it's a it's a beautiful creative flow to be in and I think 
those periods of life are really interesting that you just talked about there where you know you felt unemployable you know I've certainly had big gaps in my career where I've thought oh god I, my luck has run out this is it now but I think I now like to view them as moments where you you outgrow yourself you know you 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 outgrow the old skin and you you start a new chapter and actually that is so exciting and liberating of course it's shit scary but it's a really good place to sort of learn and grow and and also you're you know incredibly dedicated and hard working so as you said you know you you pick yourself back up and you you make new things happen and that's exactly what you're doing and we're going to get on to your creative flow in depth in a bit because you're doing some incredible stuff that I'm so excited about but there, there's so much more I want to get to first so this episode of happy place came about because you you sent me an email and it was really nice to hear from you I haven't seen you in quite a while and I sat there reading your email um just kind of you know really grateful that you were willing to share your story with me and also kind of in shock because I've known you for so long but there was so much I didn't know about you and it's so interesting how that is often the case that we will work with people every day or we will see you know parents at the school gate and we just don't know the half of it and it and it that is certainly the case with you so you know, you had this moment last year, October last year, where you decided to talk very publicly about a part of your life that you hadn't before, but via the medium of song. And you released this song called Your Car, which is about your, your late dad. And, oh my God. I mean, the first time I heard that song, it broke me in two. It is just it's as raw as you get it's so oh, well as you know you wrote it it's utterly beautiful and this explores you know the the relationship you have with your dad and and the difficulties of your childhood why did the medium of song feel right because that's obviously a very new thing for you yeah so firstly thanks for saying nice things about it and thanks for listening to it it's um it's 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 very strange hearing people um talk about it or even knowing that people have listened to it or connected to it in some way because it was an incredibly uh, uh worrying thing to to put out there and I sort of sat on it for a, for a little while um so so about the age when I probably came and did radio with you it was I was sort of in the epicenter of of what, what had been going on which is that my dad um took his own life when I was God, I must have been 22, I think. It's quite hard. Um, I, the sort of, my autobiographical memory for that time is really cloudy, as I, I guess as a sort of self-protection thing over yeah. the years. Um, so when I was 22, he, yeah, he, he killed himself. And it, it wasn't totally unexpected. He, um, he had suffered with, we think, bipolar but basically a manic depression. So he would have these massive waves of quite intense manic energy where he'd stay up all night and he'd go off and do wild things. Um, and then the flip side of that is that he was deeply, deeply depressed. And, um, you know, I've experienced, and we'll talk about it later, I've experienced depression to a degree, but what he was suffering was... In I sort of never seen anything like it. it was incredibly debilitating he 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 sort of couldn't get out of bed or do anything and he was incredibly anxious and um and he was sort of going through that and then he and I when I, when I was a teenager he and I had had this tremendous uh fallout and we we hadn't really well he hadn't really reached out to kind of try and repair the bonds and uh and eventually I had to do it when I was sort of 18. And um, it was it was quite difficult because I didn't really like him as a person. I, I had a lot of hatred towards him, but I also loved him because he was my dad. And um, I went to see him and I, I, I could tell at that time that he wasn't really himself and I didn't know what it was that was going on. And then he he made a, he wrote a suicide note about, maybe four months before he then eventually did kill himself. And uh, my mum found it and he he basically intimated that he was going to go off and, and uh, I think he said he was going to walk into the sea or something like that. Anyway, massive like 
police manhunt. They, they were incredibly quick at reacting and they went and they, they found him. And at that point I was living in London. I was like, right, this is bad. Something's going on here. I'm going to have to go home and have a chat. And I went back and he was just incredibly depressed. And um, he, he felt very helpless. And he revealed to me something which now I know it. I almost feel foolish for not putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together when I was a kid, because there were so many signs there. But he revealed that he was an alcoholic. And as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, I, do you know what? I kind of must have known that on some level. My own relationship with alcohol has been that I've never wanted to go near it. I've never, never touched it. My sister was the same. So there was something, there was obviously something about it that had connected with me. And since working with the therapist to kind of explore this stuff, which I had really tried to bury very deep because it was extremely painful. Um, I sort of was able to connect loads of dots from my childhood and anyone who's got an alcoholic family member or an alcoholic parent or maybe is an alcoholic themselves will kind of know that there are so many clues and signs there but it's often hidden or it's just denied if it's ever raised it's sort of um it's either denied or or an energy comes out which means that it's off limits for for talking about and that was very much the the sort of the energy of the household you know it was if anything was ever mentioned about um drinking it was just oh no no, no swept under the rug or you know my dad would get angry about it and so when he said to me I you know I think I'm an alcoholic immediately we kind of well firstly for me it was a, a revelation of how did I not know this and how could I have not helped sooner and the first thing we did was try and get him into an AA meeting which he went to and he went to that uh, I guess, you know, maybe on and off over those next couple of months. And on the day that he died, he was meant to go to, to one of those meetings, but didn't. And, you know, I think he had been continuing to drink and continuing to suffer with de deeply with the depression and, uh, and yeah, took his own life. And he did it in our, in our family home. My mum was the person that discovered him and, um, my, my initial feeling about it was one of just absolute anger towards him that he could do that to himself and to us and to my mum that she would have to experience that and you know I've not spoken to her much about it because I I know that if I sort of knew the room where it had happened it would taint my memories of that house and of my childhood irreparably I think and so I've sort of shielded myself from the details um so I had, so it happened, this thing happened, and I sort of felt like I was sucked from my life in London, which I'd sort of run away to anyway, because I'd had such a bad relationship with him. You know, I left house as kind of early as I could really, and got, got out and was really lucky that I landed CBBC and was able to kind of embark upon a, a life away from my childhood. Um, but it sort of sucked me back to, to Portsmouth, which is where I'm from, for, for a few days. And, you know, we had to arrange the funeral. And anyone who's been through this, it's just, it's chaotic. And my mum was in no state to do anything. And I, I guess I took on the energy of, like, the organiser, which is very opposite to my general life. I'm very disorganised. But I was like, right, I'm going to ignore the hatred and the sadness. And I'm just going to, we're going to organise a funeral and I'm going to go back to my life. And that's what I did. And I, I came back to my life and I just did not talk about it with anyone for years and years. My closest friends wouldn't, you know, they came to the funeral, they knew what happened, but we just never spoke about it. It was utter, uh, almost like a denial that it had happened because I was so angry, I was so angry and so upset. And, uh, and it was easier, the story was easier in my head for it to be, oh, I didn't like him anyway, he's dead now. Um, uh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm fine. And of course I wasn't fine. I just wasn't, I, did, I had no root power to access that. And then I guess around my sort of mid to late twenties, I, I started getting depressive episodes and I, I thought, oh, I, maybe I've got 
something like my dad had, you know, some sort of depression. And they would sort of come in these quite cyclical waves where I would feel pretty good and then I really wouldn't feel good. And the, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really put a finger on how long the not feeling good would last for. And when I wasn't feeling good, I was, you know, really panicked because anyone who's experienced depression, you sort of feel like as much as you can reason, oh, this maybe won't happen forever. Uh, it, at the time, you, that logic doesn't really hit through. It's just, you just feel really low, really low. And so I eventually, I mean, I tried a few things. I tried to do um, some cognitive behavioral therapy through the NHS and the problem was that by the time I came to do it, such a long waiting list, by the time I came to do it, I was no longer in a depressive state. And I thought, ah, this was like a problem from, 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 from another guy. And so I just sort of didn't take it seriously. And it wasn't until maybe I'd had three or four of these, I thought I really need to go and see someone about this. I went to a doctor and said, hi, I, I have this thing where, um, where I get depressed quite a lot. And they said, well, there, are there any other symptoms? And we sort of spoke through my personality and they said, oh yeah, we think you've got this thing called cyclothymia. And then I went to see a, um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I can never remember which one it was, but the person that categorizes these things. And they said, yes, you have this thing called cyclothymia. And I, I'd never heard of it before. I'd never heard anyone talk about it. I didn't know what it was. I had to go and Google it, but it, it, basically was the answer to who I am. And I always thought I was someone with a lot of energy and excitement and productivity. But it turns out that that's sort of the flip side of that depression I was talking about. And I came to realize, and actually it happened around the birth of my kid, Ivy, I was in one of these slightly more manic phases or up phases. Manic maybe isn't the right word, but it's it's like a it's an ultra productive. You feel almost invincible. It's if you've ever been in a in what people describe as a flow state, where the universe kind of disappears and you're singularly focused on a task. I was sort of in a perpetual one of those, which is amazing if you're trying to get ideas out and be productive. But it's quite destructive for the people that you live with because you know, you don't, you forget to eat, you're not interested in life, you don't want to go for a walk, you just want to zone in on whatever this idea you've got, which feels like the most important thing in the world, just want to zone in on that thing. So I thought I'm a guy with depression, but it turns out I'm a guy with depression and with this sort of flip side of it. And cyclothymia is, it's sort of like a watered down bipolar. So if you think about the extremes of bipolar as being uh, hypermania, so staying up all night, being awake for days, not wanting to sleep. I mean, there's lots of symptoms to it, but it's sort of manic, often risky, um, a sort of slightly obsessed behavior around doing things that feel fun. And, and in that state, state, you feel like, I guess the happiest a person can feel or the, or the most up a person can feel. Like think of your best day when you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, oh, I'm, I look great today. And, I'm really successful. I've got loads of great ideas. It's that energy. And then for a manic depressive or someone with bipolar, the other end of the scale is very deep depression, like I described that my dad had. And so with cyclothymia, it's those same bookends, but the threshold is it has moved in. So the mania is never as manic as someone with bipolar, and the depression is never as deep as someone with bipolar, but you're sort of touching the sides of it. And so for me, it manifested as something, this energy where I thought, oh, it's, I'm just a really productive guy. And often people would say, how are you doing all this stuff? You, you've, you've made so many things in the last month. My agent would be like, can we get this thing? You know, I know it's going to take you probably a, a month to get it like a pitch or something for a TV show. And the next day I'd have it. And it was this sort of energy that I would fall into where you'd get, I mean, it's so hard to describe, but you'd get, um, days or weeks worth of stuff done in hours because you were just locked into it and if you ever came back to it and I find it all the time if I ever come back to something that I worked on at a time when I was in a sort of up cyclothymic stage I've got no idea what it is I don't know how to undo it 
you know, sometimes I've had to go and tweak things in presentations or make alterations to some of the board games I've made or, or even with the song stuff, check, going and change stuff. And I, it's like it was made by somebody else. Wow. And so, and so I realized I had this sort of, it wasn't that I was just depressed. I had this sort of dual thing going on. And the minute someone put a label on it, it changed my life because I was able to understand, oh, I'm not just depressed. This is a thing that's going to come in a wave. And maybe I can, if I don't fall into the up as much as I have done, and that's a really hard thing to do because it's like someone opening the gates to Disneyland and saying, run free. But if I can stop myself from doing that and I can kind of try and control that flow state a bit and not let it control me, brilliant. But also, now that I know it's the sort of the, the other side of the same coin with the depression, I can kind of trick myself out of falling into a depression by using some of the things that I would do in, an, in the up stages. And since, since getting just the word cyclothymia and knowing what it was, I've been able to just clock myself and go, oh, I have that, I have that feeling that I really want to drop everything else in my life and go and work on God knows what. Maybe I should give it a couple of days. I know that's hard. It feels horrible to do, but maybe I should just not fall into it. And if I'm still as excited by the idea in two days time, then I can approach it and I can control the flow rather than it control me. And then similarly with the, if I start to feel low, I can say to myself, okay, what can I do that's going to take my brain out of the obsessive, spiraling, anxious, depressed, um, uh, what's the word? Like a, when you catastrophizing sort of state of mind and maybe switch my energy into something that feels has the illusion of productivity and that's where the music came in so i you know i obviously play songs on the radio all the time but my engagement with the music was really passive and we'd had a piano in our house as a kid and i'd never touched it didn't touch it once and i really thought why why would i do that what am i going to get out of that i can't i can't sing i can't you know i have no interest in learning it and then for the radio, I had this very transformative experience where I got to go to a recording studio for a day to make a silly song. And I guess, as I've just described, that I've spent my whole life, or like my favorite energy really is, I've got an idea, can I get it out into the world? It's almost part of, I think, the condition. It's like, if you think it, I have to almost uh, like expunge it from my body somehow. And... We went into this recording studio and a producer there played a note that I just hummed a bit out of tune into a, into a keyboard. And it was like the thought had directly been downloaded from my brain. And I liked that feeling. I thought, that's amazing that this thing I've just, I've just thought it and now it's there, it exists in this computer. And then we did it with another note and he did it again. And I thought, oh my God, I have to learn how to do this. It was, it was so immediate in that moment where I thought, I don't, I don't know where to begin, but I have to learn how to do that. And so I did, I sort of dabbled with it on and off, you know, played on garage band on my phone and didn't know anything at all. You know, I never played an instrument and uh, knew no music theory. I'd never, I mean, I literally never, never done anything musical at all. And then lockdown happened and I thought, right, this thing that I've been sort of tinkering with as a hobby, maybe I should try and write a song and I said to myself I'm going to try and do a song about about anything in in that first lockdown so I bought some speakers and I bought like a little keyboard that you plug into your computer despite not knowing how to play it and I thought I'm going to sit and write a song and I sat down and so I don't know music theory but I know enough that I can play some chords in C major which if you play piano is just all the white keys it's really easy so I played some something on the white keys and the computer's quite clever. It can it can turn it into different um, musical keys. So you know you can play something in C, but it can make it in F sharp or whatever. So I it was found a nice sort of a tonal place, and I played these three chords, and they were quite sad. And I was like, oh, I, okay. And I just looped them over. I thought I'm just going to write some lyrics to these. And at this point, I'd still not at any point thought about my my dad. It wasn't going to. It wasn't like a thing. I'm going to sit down and write it. And I had this little melody that popped into my head which was the opening melody of that your car song and 
the word, I just wrote the words without thinking, I always hated the smell of your car. And I was like, that's such a weird thing to write. And then I thought, well, I sort of did with that with my dad, because certainly as a teenager, it was very difficult because we'd had this huge falling out. And I and I really, I really did did not want to be around him. But I was a child and he was my dad. And so sometimes he would have to drive me to things, things that I would want to go to. And I had to be in the car with him. And I I remember feeling at the time, like I know he's been drinking, hadn't clocked that he was an alcoholic, but I was like, I know he's had too much to drink and I feel unsafe in the car. And, but I have no other option. I can't get to where I need to go without him. And so I felt very fragile in that space. And I thought, well, maybe that's the song. And I wrote it honestly in about 10 minutes. And I, I was in floods of tears. It was a very odd experience. I was just in this, this spare room of our house, crying my eyes out as I wrote this thing. And it, it, um, yeah, it, ha- it, it came out of me incredibly quickly. And it was sort of everything that I wanted to say. And around maybe maybe six months before that, I'd sought a therapist to go and talk about some of these feelings. And they were, you know, they were pushed down very low to the point where I said to my therapist, she's like, you know, any major life events, and I'd explain some things that had gone on because I was feeling really, you know, anxious and um, uh, depressed. And I'd found out about the cyclothymia thing. And I thought maybe I should go and talk to someone about it all. And she, I said, well, you know, my dad killed himself when I was 22, but, um, that's fine. I'm fine with that. So, you know, we don't need to go into it. And of course, anyone who's had therapy or is thinking about it, you know, in an incredibly organic way, they'll ask you questions that bring those feelings to the surface. And I realized there was a lot to deal with. And she had suggested that maybe I write a letter to my dad explaining some of the feelings or write it down somehow. And I kind of hadn't done it because it was too still too painful. The idea of, even now, I think the idea of writing a letter to my dad, I would find incredibly hard because this it's such a swirling ball of um, very conflicting emotions. But there was something about putting it into this song where I hadn't decided that that's what I was going to do and it just sort of happened. Uh, and then I, so I had these, these piano chords and I, and I had the song and I phoned my friend Amy, who I had sort of met a couple of years back and I'd seen she was a singer and a singer on Instagram and I just loved her voice and I said look I've written this thing I don't I don't think it's ever going to go anywhere or do anything but would you record it because I can't sing I was like could would you record it and uh and she just did the most amazing job at delivering it and she gets something about this all this file and I spent maybe a month figuring out how to make it into a thing that sounded listenable because I'd never produced anything before so you know it's like the first time you've learned anything, uh, it's like, you know, thinking about driving a car for the first time, it's, it's sort of the same thing as that. You know, you, you, it's like sitting in a spaceship, you don't know what any of the buttons do, and it's kind of the same, but it's actually like a spaceship with, with music production because there's so many things you could do. And um, so, yeah, I just, I just sort of worked on it with the view to never doing anything with it, just, just like it's a thing for me, it's going to keep me happy, it's going to keep me busy in lockdown. And it's going to give me this new skill. But my God, it was the most cathartic thing I've ever done because I sort of listened to the song maybe 500 times in the space of a month. And, um, and yes, yeah, sort of figured out how to, how to make a song. And then at the end of it, I didn't do anything with it. I didn't even play it to anyone because I was too, it was too exposing. And then the anniversary, the 10, the 10 year anniversary of his, maybe it wasn't 10 year, maybe it was more than that, but it was the anniversary of his, his, uh, death was happening and I thought oh I've made this thing and it was kind of duly exposing because you know I didn't didn't know what I was doing with the music thing and I guess I that part of me that's quite anxious worried what are people gonna think everyone's gonna think this song's rubbish you stay in your lane Matt what are you doing and then the other part of it was I don't know if I'm ready to share this thing with people that I've just not shared with anyone and I spoke about it with my wife and I had to go and talk to my mum about it because obviously she's, you know, incredibly involved in the story. I spoke to my sister and it was a hard conversation with my mum because I had to say, look, I've made this song about my about dad and it's, it's not all that positive. 
And it's this sort of thing that we've never spoken about as a family. I, I, I think I'd like to talk about it. She was incredibly lovely and said, you know, she listened to the song and she um, cried about it and she was really sorry for all, all the things that had gone on. And I guess her, her role in it of probably knowing what was going on and, and not doing anything about it and, and herself being quite passive. Um, and I sort of put it out into the world and I put it, <laughs> if you've ever done this, you put something out and then just turn your phone off. I was like, I don't, I don't want to know really for a day or two how this has landed, whether anyone's said anything about it. Or, and I came back to it maybe 10 hours after I'd put it up there. I thought, what's going on? And in, in the interim, I'd had loads of messages from friends and people I'd known for years saying we had no idea and we've listened to it. And, um, and amazingly, it was amazing how many people had been through a similar thing where they had a parent who was either an alcoholic or who had taken their own life or unfortunately both for a lot of people. And I just had thousands and thousands of, of messages from people in my DMs and in comments and things. And it was, uh, it was kind of one of the most amazing days I've ever had, really, because I just sat and read through all of these stories, which were kind of identical to mine or a bit different or sometimes even sadder. And uh, people just saying things like they'd never been able to express to their partner what their childhood had been like and they could play them this song and it it made sense or even you know parents who messaged me to say I am an alcoholic and I've got a five-year-old and this song has been the impetus for me to change because I don't want my kid to think of me like that it was such a uh, sort of mixture of uh just incredible stories and I sort of never you know I guess our jobs are trying to connect to audiences right that's what we do with, you know whether it's being funny or saying oh here's a song that we love or you know whatever it might be you know even if you're saying here's friends you still want people to like friends because you like friends um and it was the the purest version of that and I, I imagine that you have this a lot because of the work you do with the podcast but it was an amazing thing to have such an honest conversation that I was so scared I can't tell you how scared I was of putting it out into the world and having people receive it with a hug and with um this I guess the same energy that I was that I was putting out there and uh and yeah it was um it was amazing it was absolutely amazing and it sort of it accomplished two things I guess one was finally talking about this thing because if you'd have come to me three years ago and said, hey, Matt, I heard your dad killed himself. Can you talk about it on Happy Place? I'd have said, absolutely not. We're not yeah. talking about that ever. So it's utterly freeing to be able to say these things happened and there's no shame attached to it from, from my side. And maybe it can help other people in whatever, however they might connect to it, help them process something that's going on. Or even maybe someone thinks, I might go and do some therapy because it seems to have helped other people. And I would have been firmly in the camp of like, ah, it's not for me. I don't need to talk to anyone about this. My God, it's just, you know, it, it's made my life so much better, indescribably better. Um, so that was a very long answer to your question. No, it's, <laughs> but it, that is, wow, it's deeply moving hearing you talk about it and, you know, like I said, that that it's such a special piece of work that you've created, and well, you know that you, as you've just described, you've had this deeply connective reaction to it, and and your own form of catharsis. And listening to you talk there, I was wondering, now you've started to, you know, with therapy, but also now with this beautiful new hobby you've got of exploring song production and songwriting. And I know you're exploring other themes outside of this yourself, but when looking at the song, Your Car, and you having to sort of go back to that time, and you're now exploring that era of your life, I wonder what relationship you have with those memories. And it, it's something that I think about a lot, because I had a you know, my own sort of form of trauma, very different to yours, but, but happened in my life, which led to a 
you know, whole unraveling. And now I'm doing this weird new career that I really love. But, but you know, at the time, there, there are still some memories that I find very, very difficult to sit with. And I, I have suppressed them and I've tried to make them go away. And then I've done forms of therapy where I have to sort of say them out loud and write them down and I've hated it, but it has, it has moved me through it with a bit more ease, but it's still hard to have, you know, and, and much like yourself, but again, for very different reasons, my memory at certain periods of my life is unbelievably blurry. I, I don't know when things happened, the order of them, it, it, it's, a, it's a massive blur. But I do want to integrate some of that time of my life back into my memory because I think I feel disconnected at times in life because I'm trying to banish bits of it. I'm just trying to press delete. Bye, that didn't happen. Go away. And you can't. You can't do that. It'll always manifest in some sort of you know, negative emotional reaction or physical ailment or whatever. And I've experienced all of that. So, so how, how do you deal with with extremely painful memories and you know you're unable to ignore that they've happened you're talking about it out loud now what is your relationship with those memories so i think even as i talk to you now it's quite a um this uh, there's still some level of guard up if that makes sense because i think if i really it's all i feel like i'm almost telling my story on behalf of me I, that's a strange way of putting it, but I think there have been times where I've come out of a therapy session or, you know, something's just happened that has reminded me of something from my childhood or from around uh, my dad died. Now, I'm still, you know, 22, still quite a young point in your life for something like, like what happened to happen. Um, so interestingly, in terms of dealing with the with the pain of it and and with those memories one of the things that sort of has come up for me is that my my um threshold for sensitivity is really low so i get um i get very anxious very quickly about things perhaps at a point where other people might not and the way that I've, I've I've got two therapists, so one's like a talky one, and one focuses on trying to expand my threshold of being able to handle difficult situations, which means, like you just described, we sort of talk about those difficult situations and then sit in it, so that our bod my body gets used to not having to go to fight or flight necessarily. Yeah. And I mean, it's a horrible exercise. Horrible. But it's it's very it's very worth it. And, and after those, those sessions, firstly, I feel incredibly exhausted. It's, it's like as tired as I can imagine feeling. And it, there's a sort of half-life of the conversation that lasts for a number of days afterwards, a sort of echo of it that, that stays with me. And I often find that I have to go and talk to Bryony about, about it and say, this thing that I would never have thought was bad I re now realize was really bad and it has had a strong impact on me and it's hard because I think the there was a sort of myth that I told myself and probably other people that my childhood was just a really yeah it's great you know it's really fun I had a great time and and it and it really wasn't that and I was I was I was having to sort of take on a lot of um anxiety and a lot of responsibility because of uh I, I guess because of how my dad was and it's, it's interesting like I was I was quite I had quite an unusual I probably still am a bit unusual for my age but like an unusual teenager in that I always felt really responsible for everything I never wanted to go out and go like go, go to parties or drink or take drugs or lose control of anything I just wanted to feel safe and secure and not in any sort of jeopardy yeah and um and you know I sort of used to joke like it's like I'm a 45 year old man in the body of a child and I, I, get, I think I sort of was because I, I felt 
I felt very like if I wasn't in control, then who was um, for lots of it. And the hard, I think the hard thing about working back to those memories has been um, remembering moments, which at the time just felt like odd moments, scary moments and seeing them through the lens of, oh, my dad was an alcoholic. And uh, I think, you know, being a dad now myself, I have an, a tremendous amount of sadness and sympathy for me as a kid. Um, because it's, it, th some things happen that, you know, you should just shouldn't have to, shouldn't have to go through. And actually my, one happened about two weeks ago that sent me flying back. So my wife, Bryony is pregnant at the moment. And I did um, not know she that. Ha she's pregnant. We're having another oh, one. Oh, amazing. Uh, very exciting, yeah. Due in due in January 2022. So depending oh, on this has gone out, it's either here or not here. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we're having another little little girl, which I'm very excited about. Um, but the other day, Bryony um, had she'd just been doing too much stuff. She'd gotten up. She hadn't had enough water. She hadn't had anything to eat, and she'd been sort of running around the house. I think she's very much in the nesting phase. She's just tidying things up. And she said to me, I'm feeling a bit woozy. And then she fainted and vomited on our kitchen table. And it's about the scariest thing I've ever seen. So I was immediately on the phone to the ambulance. She came around after about 25 seconds. But um, when it was happening, it was so scary. And it it sucked me back to this. And, and Bryony was very unfazed by it. She was like, oh, you know, I fainted before. It's, I know the reasons it can happen in pregnancy. I, should, I needed to take it a bit easier. She was so relaxed. And I was like, that can never, ever happen again. And that can never happen if Ivy's nearby. Because I remember a, a day, God, I don't know how old I was, must have been, seven or eight. And my mum and sister had gone out and my dad was looking after me. And I was just upstairs playing in my bedroom and He'd put himself in this uh, this like little outhouse room that we had, and he went in there to smoke, which was another massive bugbear for us as kids. Like he was, a, you know, he smoked all the time and, and tried to hide it. And we we hated it, but he would go in there to smoke and I assume now drink because I remember as a kid coming down and seeing him in the room, and I needed him for something. I don't know what it was, but I just needed him, and he was slumped over in the chair and he was kind of drooling and he looked dead like to a seven-year-old he looked dead and uh i he'd locked the door and i couldn't get to him and i could see him through this glass and i i was i went into you know extreme panic because i thought he died and i was in the house all alone i didn't know what to do and i was hammering on the glass hammering 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 and I thought, do I break the glass? Do I go? What do I do? And I, there were no mobile phones, so I didn't. I couldn't phone anyone. We had the landline. I was sort of seven. I didn't really know who to phone. And I can't remember what I did. I, I, whether I maybe went to find a neighbour, or I, I, I genuinely cannot remember what the outcome was. But I know that at some point he woke up. Maybe within half an hour, forty-five minutes after that. And I was just in, you know, floods of tears. And it was just immediately downplayed. Oh, I was just asleep. I was just a how silly. I was just asleep. And at the time, I think I was made to feel like I'd overreacted. And looking back, what had happened was he'd drunk himself unconscious and was slumped in a chair. And, you know, I was in a house on my own at seven. My dad trapped behind glass, not knowing who, who to call, what to do, thinking he was dead and it's hard looking back at yourself and having love for yourself at that time but if I imagine that happening to my daughter now the sort of ang the anger I would have if she had experienced that and the sadness I would have if she experienced that um I, I would never want her to to have anything like that happened to her and so as painful as it is to have those things come up it's only by being it's only through talking about them 
and actually feels liberating talking to you about it because I think I had, you know, shame and embarrassment and uh, I guess, uh, yeah, a, a, a feeling of my own, I don't know, my own inadequacy attached to that thing that happened to me. And it was one of like many things that viewed through the lens of, oh, I had a dad who was both an alcoholic and also had these massive extreme mood swings. It's really hard environment, and my and my mum pretty much not not addressing any of it and just really sweeping everything under the rug. It's a it was a crazy stressful environment to to grow up in, amplified by um, my my teenage years and, and I was and I was not getting on. So it was um, so yeah. In terms of in terms of dealing with the the, the pain of it. I found just continuing to talk about it. And I'm sure for every therapy session I have, there'll be an, another thing that crops up that I thought, oh, I thought that happened to everyone. Um, yeah. And then realized, oh no, that was, that was, you know, a res that was not my fault or, you know, that was a, something that happened because so, of the circumstances I was in. So interesting how, and I, I've, I've definitely had this situation where shame stops you from talking and you, you know, I, I, I still have things now that I, and I've done a lot of therapy, but I still have things hidden that I feel ashamed to say out loud. And, I, and it's because I'm judging me, not, no one else is judging me. You know, the therapist isn't going to judge me, but I still have great lumps of shame that block me from saying it. And, and like you've just eloquently put, you know, by speaking these things aloud, that is liberation it's, it's not going to take it away it's not going to solve it it's not going to eradicate the memories or the feelings but there is liberation in it and it does I don't know how you feel about it but I think it does slightly dilute the situation it's not such a big scary hidden thing anymore it might just be a big scary thing but it's certainly not something you're trying to suppress and keep secret and there is liberation in that and I'm I'm really glad that you're at the point where you're, you're talking about it and you're, you know, you're, you're working through, and it's a lot of work. And it, as you said, you know, for every session you have, there'll be another thing to work through. You know, perhaps I think for most of us, this work is, is lifelong, you know, especially for someone like you, that's been through, you know, deep trauma and has a lot of complicated emotions attached to it. It's, um, it's a real commitment. It's a real commitment, but but always worth it, even though it is extremely hard work, always worth working through it. And, you know, and alongside the shame, you've also got a really complicated flavor of grief going on. It's not straight up grief, which is as horrendous as it gets anyway, but you've got grief tinged with anger, resentment i don't know if this is just still past tense or, is, or if this is something you're still working through no no it's 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 still there i mean yeah. The, the yeah the the feelings have never never really gone away i think it's so hard because there was so much unresolved stuff with my dad and it's it's really hard to accept that it will never get resolved i will never be able to having come through this process, talk to him about it. Um, and it's it's quite hard. And, and I, I guess I also carry a sort of guilt about talking about him. You know, he's not here to give his side of the story. And he's, um, you know, I'm sure he had lots going on. And uh, th th there's a, a real feeling of, and, and also kind of guilt of like, you know, his colleagues and his uh, friends that you know his his um his mum and all those all that, that's my mum you know all the the other people involved in his life there's a sort of guilt of like maybe it's better if no one ever talks about it maybe it's just better that we all stick to the story that it was really sad he died he had depression he killed himself it was really sad rather than oh there's a whole back room of stuff that no one's talking about because what's the point? And that's how it felt for a long time. And what's the point of dredging this up? But the point is that it's healing, at least for, for me, um, and, and for those of us that are still here. And amazingly, I, I, you know, after doing therapy, I said to my mum, look, 
I really think you should give this a go. And she had that same, that same feeling, which is actually, if you're getting by without thinking about it all the time, the idea that you would pay someone to think about it feels crazy. It feels like a crazy idea. And I, I always think about it in terms of, you know, if you had a phobia of spiders, say, and someone said, look, come and pay someone loads of money and they're going to talk to you relentlessly about spiders. And at the end of it, they're going to put a spider on your hand and you're going to feel OK about it. You'd think, do I really need that spider on my hand? I don't know. I, I've coped this far without it. Maybe I won't do it. But actually, you, you don't realise all the other things that not having that spider in your hand is dictating in your life. Yeah. And so and your, and your reaction to things in life. I think you get so you normalize it. This is how I, I react in that situation. I'm anxious about that or I'm irritated by that. But the root cause is the thing you're not wanting to look at. Yeah, it's it's been an amazing in terms of in terms of um, my marriage and my relationship. It's been an amazing thing to go through because you realize, oh, this isn't how everyone reacts to that thing or maybe i'm particularly sensitive around x y or z and other people aren't and you know my my the big th big themes for me are justice that runs through like almost everything i do this feeling of there's been no justice because of the the big fallout i had my dad where basically i don't i that's one that i'm like oh god i don't know if i can go into it but um there was a, there was a, a sense of injustice around something that happened, and uh, my God, it stuck with me till the end of time. And actually, for me, getting to justice is a thing that I'm trying to have control over, or like, or try and try and not let it control all of my thoughts. And then the other one is shame, and I think it's quite it's probably quite prevalent in people who do what we do because you've always got the idea looming over you that it could all end at any point and how would you cope if you then ran into someone that you had once worked with or what and they say hey what's going on with you now and you have to say nothing i used to be someone and now i'm nothing and um that that feeling come must come from or does come from that sense of carrying shame around in in your childhood because some people would just be like oh yeah i'm fine i'll just go and do something else or i'll you know find something else that i love or you know they just wouldn't worry about it but for me yeah shame and shame and justice are like the two themes that keep i keep coming back to of uh of things that personally i can develop in myself i think shame is oh i mean i've listened to every brene brown talk on it because i just think it's such a ugly one to lug around and it debilitates so many people but it's one because it's shame we don't really talk about it it's too sticky mm. it's too awkward it's it's sort of mortifying and I I mean I I certainly have that reaction looking just in an isolated way at the career we have you know I don't really do telly anymore and even that out saying that out loud is like is that okay to say out loud I don't really do it I don't really do it anymore no one asks me I don't put myself for I just don't do it and I definitely have had shame around that and I've had people say oh what, what are you doing these days because they're not in the podcasting thing they don't know about the other stuff I'm doing and I have to really get to a good place to go I'm really creatively fulfilled and doing stuff that I love rather than what do you mean I work every day I'm working really I like to go on the defense <laughs> about it it's um it's such a funny one but I think when you've got it buried deep down with deep situations in your life it just tiny things bring that stuff to the surface and you know like you say doing whether it is spoken word therapy or some sort of physical therapy is is a brilliant way and I think that's it's really interesting especially when you're talking about anxiety to look at the physical manifestations because anxiety for a lot of people is purely physical for me it is you know cognitively I can always make sense of the situation that's bothering me and I can go I know intellectually that I am safe it will be fine my body belongs to someone else I feel like I have no control over it my triggers vary and some of the just very normal things like you know going to bed sometimes is enough to just go oh I can't I, I'm meant to be sleeping and I'm not and then my body's like Bleh! like raving away and looking at, at some sort of physical therapy to help release that physical that cellular 
stored shit within you is is key is, is your anxiety cognitive and physical how does it sit yeah so it was for years it was purely cognitive and then it started to manifest itself more physically in the last couple of years um so so mine so generally with the, with the cyclothymia so ideally most of the time i'm in a pretty neutral space where i guess a lot of people are some and, and actually since um getting the diagnosis i've i've neither gone into a full cyclothymic up wow process or a full cyclothymic down process because i'm just aware that it could Ooh. happen so and when i feel either of them i'm able to do things to stop it happening um one of which feels great when you're trying to stop depression trying to stop the up phase is as i said is horrible yeah. because you're just like oh man i, I really want, want some of that give me some of that um so yeah for, for me the anxiety comes as catastrophic uh thinking so it's a lot of what ifery it's um and it can start incredibly small you know i said this thing to this person well, what if they say it but they haven't put the context in well, oh. what if that gets back to this person and what if that person and it always ends with like me sleeping under a bridge it, it always comes back to that and i and i have to i have to um i have to in my head become comfortable with whatever the worst case scenario is but it's horrible because as soon as you do that the next thought comes in well, what if this what if that and it's incredibly hard because they come trojan horsed as your own thoughts you don't feel like they're anxious thoughts when they're happening. They feel like they're, they're trying to help you. Yeah, they're real, but they feel like they're trying to help you. You're like, oh, I'm really worried because I, I didn't, I went for this job and I didn't get it. So your brain goes, well, that's because you're not relevant anymore. And no one's ever going to put you on TV anymore. And actually you have to find something else to do, but you have no other skills. So what else are you going to do? Well, nothing. You'll have to do nothing. Well, okay. You'll have to sell your house. And then, it, 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 you know, it, it, it spirals like that. And um what's difficult is it feels like it's a problem solving thing and it sort of is because it's the same part of my brain that's really good at solving problems and coming up with formats of board games or or getting into that flow state it's like there's a little problem solver in there and sometimes it wants to actually help me solve things and sometimes it just wants to give me these crazy um visions of the future but, but both of them are kind of the same thing. Like one's a crazy vision of the future where you make this thing and it's going to be amazing and it's going to, you're going to hold it in your hands at the end of it. And you, you might see it on the shelves in a shop or someone might listen to it or someone might watch this thing. Oh my God, it's going to be amazing. And it's exactly the same uh, force that's doing that on the, on the flip side. So when the flip side comes, yeah, it manifests itself as, as obsessive, uh, anxious swirling thoughts i just cannot get rid of and uh and yeah in more recent years it's it's manifested it in i sort of got like a tick a sort of physical twitch so i had a couple of panic attacks which i'd never had before i didn't really understand what they were but my god i know you i know you have them and um it's just all it's absolutely awful absolutely just the worst and um uh, since the second one i uh I get this thing sometimes where where I feel stressed or overwhelmed. And sometimes I don't even know it. I don't know that I'm feeling that, but something about the environment's making me feel uh, ill at ease. I'll get a sort of full body twitch. It's almost like a kind of Tourette style tick. And um and I'm so I'm, and that, and that, that's what led me to this physical therapist to try and figure out like what's going on, how can I deal with it? And uh, it doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, it's really, I mean, it's a bit annoying to be honest, because I'll, sometimes I'll, even something stressful on TV, something, something will happen on TV. I watch Squid Game. Oh, I and can't, no way. I can't, yeah, well, I didn't know, I wasn't, I didn't know anything about it when I started watching it. Just that like, oh, everyone loves this show. And the first episode, which if you are sensitive, I would avoid. Exactly. Um, it's incredibly uh, graphic and um, and shocking and surprising and and, and there's no sort of fore forewarning of it. And I found myself twitching whilst watching it because on some level, my body was, or my brain, whatever, whatever part of me was feeling uncomfortable with it. So whilst I could rationally say, oh, it's a TV show, those are actors, this stuff that I'm seeing didn't actually happen. It's, it's entertainment. There was something going on in me that, that 
couldn't handle it. Um, so yeah, so I'm sort of exploring, exploring that a little bit. But I found what I found with the, you know, the the racing thoughts, which are the sort of the first sign for me that I might be going into one of the down cyclothymia times. The way that I've been able to put put it at bay or remedy it is by doing music. So because I think to embark upon a, uh, a you know a, a project in 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 one of a better phrase for it something that's that's quite involved when you're starting to feel a bit depressed very hard to muster the energy or even to think that anything positive could come of it you would just you'd think well this idea will tank i'm worthless it's rubbish so to sit and try and do a thing it's impo impossible what i realized is that there was something about the non-committal of sitting at a little midi keyboard and just going let me just Try that synthesizer. How does that sound? Press a button. Oh, it sounds nice. Oh, that's nice. Or what if it went with this other thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe I should put some drums underneath that. And suddenly, this thing that is so non committal, because you'll probably never do anything with it. You won't, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. You're just sort of playing that kind of play. And I guess I get it a bit from doodling, from drawing as well. Um, or even, you know, if I'm with Ivy, like making something out plasticine you know, doing play-doh where you're like i'm gonna make a snowman but i'm gonna make the best one i can it's a sort of thing that stops any other thought process and just gives me a simple task to do and a task that i enjoy and at the end of it there's something you know there's a snowman or there's a doodle or there's a song at the end of it and so i found that now whenever i have a have something that comes up and my god there are so many things that trigger me into anxious thoughts but if something comes up that triggers me and Brani knows it now as well. She's like, just go upstairs, go upstairs and do an hour at your computer, just pressing keys on a keyboard and making something because it's, it's always going to sound okay. Like there's something's going to come out of it or you're always going to learn something. And it switches my attention from the horror show that's happening in my mind onto something else. And to begin with, I had a real fight against that because the way that I would, the way that I would describe it is, you know, imagine if you felt like an asteroid was a, was about to hit Earth, and everyone was like, the best way to deal with that <laughs> is just, well, no, the best way to deal with that is just to just to ignore it, you know, yeah. don't pay any attention, and you're like, guys, there's an asteroid coming. Why is no one else panicking about this? It's coming, and it feels as real to you as if it's there in the sky, and all the advice you've been given is. Try, don't give any attention to those thoughts. It's so hard. It's impossible. And, and actually, just by accepting, I'm going to give my attention to something else that's as meaningless as this worry, because, you know, worrying about something, I can't remember, there's a quote, it might be a JK Rowling quote, but it's like, what if you worry, you're, you're making yourself suffer tw twice. Yeah. Because it, the thing may happen, and if it does, you'll just have to deal with it when it does. And if it doesn't, and you've spent this chunk of your time worrying about a thing that may never happen, and it's a horrible, cruel, awful, destructive energy. And so rather than worrying about it, I now try and slip myself. I try and, yeah, uh, trick myself into a, into a bit of a flow state, and then, but a very non-committal one. And then that's often where, you know, some of the, the, fun, the fun stuff then starts to happen. But I mean, this is this has turned into a whole new thing for you now, because, you know, you obviously started off with that highly therapeutic songwriting accidentally about your dad and creating something amazing. And now you've you've got this whole new podcast coming out that I've had a sneaky listen of. And it is absolutely incredible. I mean, I messaged you afterwards just saying, what the fuck? Like, it's so brilliant. And you've reached out to singer songwriters that you love. And the podcast is you working out what you're going to create in this sort of creative session with them, that thematically what you're going to work with, melodically how you're going to make it happen. You produce it, they sing, you co-write the song together. But what, you, what you've got at the end, the result is like the James Arthur song is outstanding. I mean, it's a top 10 hit. It's so brilliant. But I wonder how, because you know, you've talked about how the, the music and the songwriting helps you 
get from that that low place or that anxious state but with you know that is quite a committed project and you've got a number of episodes in the series and some really like high caliber people you're working with how did you stop yourself from going into the sort of more you know the the, the manic or whatever you want to call it the other end of the spectrum where you're a bit one trap minded with it yeah so um when i when i first had the idea for it it definitely came from that mm. that energy of like oh my god I could do this thing and at the time you feel I certainly I it felt like it won't take long and I remember saying to Brian she was like man this feels like quite a big commitment given that you don't know how to make songs you've never made a song before it was like quite a big thing to message all these people and see if they want to come and do a song and she said maybe just try one and see how it goes and I was like honestly I think it's going to take me a day to make us to do it which was obviously ridiculous now I know what I know and I think if I'd known what I'd known about the process I may never have started it because there was so much to learn I can't you know anyone who's ever tried anything like that I can't begin to tell you how hard it has been um but I I, I did the first one I, I reached out to a girl called Maisie Peters who's fantastic so she's been si just signed by Ed Sheeran and makes brilliant pop songs she was really generous and gave me three hours to try this thing. I, I, literally, I never even made a podcast. Before, so I, hadn't I hadn't plugged in recording equipment. I'd never, the only song I'd ever written was that Your Car song. And at the time I hadn't released it. Uh, and it had taken me over a month to make it. And I said to Maisie, oh, we're going to do this thing in three hours where we write the songs. So we kind of wrote the lyrics together. And then she sent me a vocal track. And I had the same feeling of like, how do I, how do I get this done? Because it was the sort of up version of me that started it. And then the kind of slightly more mortal version of me that was having to fulfill it. And it was around that time that I was coming to doing the therapy, coming to terms with the cyclothymia. And I just treated it, tried to treat it like a job because it was in lockdown and all my other work kind of went away. Still doing the radio, sometimes from home, sometimes not. And I, and I thought, well, it's lockdown. There's nothing going on. I'm going to go... Cra genuinely crazy. I worried about, you know, being trapped in my house with my own thoughts for that time. I need a project. Why don't I just try this? And if it, if it works, great. It, not, something, nothing may ever come of it. I'll give it a try. So I did the first one with Maisie and she sent me her vocal, which was fantastic. And I had the same experience that I had on your car, which was, I don't know how to make this thing. Like, how do you do it? How? I, I have no idea. And so I w just worked at it for a month and made the song and finished it and played it back to her. And, uh, and it kind of went well. And I was like, right, I want to do it again. And I think like anything you do, you get better at it every time you do it. And because it was like, I treated it like a job. So I, I said to myself, right, I'm going to start it at 9 a.m. and I'm going to finish it at 5 a.m. and I'm going to spend all day doing this. For this month, I am a music producer, even though no one knows it. But when it comes to five, however much I want to continue, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go and I'm going to hang out with Ivy and with Bryony. And sometimes that was really hard. If I'm honest, it was really hard because there was that, the, it's so hard to remove yourself from a flow, from a flow state. And I'd spend the, the next morning, I'd spend the first two hours going, what did that guy do yesterday? That, cause it felt like a different person trying to figure out why would I have done that? But in the moment I did it. So every day it was like this discovery of basically opening someone else's work. And I, you know, I did the first one, did the second one and every time like anything I just got better at doing it and I learned loads of stuff and you know I listen back to some of the songs and go oh, I wish I'd known about mid side EQ <laughs> then uh, <laughs> or whatever it was and then in all of my down my free time I would watch YouTube tutorials of people making songs or I'd you know very specific it's quite good because each song had its own genre so you know Becky Hill I've got to make a house song well, how does that happen? Or James Arthur, I've got to make a kind of crunchy electric guitar thing. So how does that work? Or, you know, with Tom Walker, I wanted like a massive chorus that had an impact. I've just done one with Sigrid and I wanted like a ch people chanting along as part of the chorus. And so project by project, song by song, you carry with you what you've learned from the previous ones. But also, you know, the, everything's on the internet. If, if you want to figure out how to make something, if you do enough searching, you'll you'll find it and and so yeah i treated it i tried to treat it as much like a job as i could and the workload has been 
ridiculous. And obviously then since the world opened up and a lot of my other work came along and I sort of at the same time as doing this, my two lockdown projects were this and this board games company and they were sort of coexisting and vying for my attention. Um, I feel like I've come to the end of both, or, 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 I'm nearly at the end of that, um, that process with both of them now. I've got a couple of the songs left to mix and all the board games are now finally out. And there's a couple of tweaks we're making for them internationally, but they're mostly done. Um, but it, it sort of saved my life in, in, in the pandemic because it's, I find it very hard not having something on. Uh, yeah. And I, and it genuinely doesn't ever need to see the light of day in a weird way. It just turns out that these two things have seen the light of day, but it, Honestly, if I could have made the, one of the board games and played it with a group of mates once and they'd all said, oh, we really enjoyed that, I'd have been able to rest easy because it's just the process that drives me rather than the result of the process. Um, and for me, the minute I play the song back on Not Another Love Song, the song's back to the people and they go, oh, that's better than I thought it would be. I'm like, oh, I don't need anything else. Yeah. I'm just happy that, I'm, happy that I made a thing. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been the most amazing and fulfilling and sort of, um, life altering thing. Cause I think, you know, I was, I was, I wasn't still, I'm wedded to the, what I imagined I'd do for a job as a kid. It was like, yeah, I'm going to be a TV presenter and I don't get me wrong. I love it. I love, still love being a TV studio, but do I love sitting in this room making a song more i don't know maybe i do yeah. um and and actually maybe i'm truly at my happiest when i'm just sort of quietly making something yeah, and, fi and, and figuring out how to make it and like the you know the learn the learning is i like that almost as much as anything else it's it's quite strange i you know i i didn't i i was quite good at school i was i was good at doing school but I never really enjoyed it. I never really had sort of a love for learning necessarily, but, um, but I can't, you know, I, I can't get enough of it when it comes to this stuff. It's, I'm, I'm so, if you saw my internet history, you think this is the most boring man. <laughs> He's just like so reading about compressors. This is not only the power of music, which obviously we've, we've both got a, you know, radio career going on and it's, it's deeply impactful we know that for the audiences but also for us and also for me it's you know it's the power of creativity it, it, it can it just it saves the day every time and a lot of people out there think they're not creative but everybody has the propensity to be creative to create something and it just so happens like you say that your stuff is seeing the light of day but not only that we can't downplay it what you're creating is beautiful and honestly I urge people to listen to this podcast because I just found the whole process astounding and so brilliant. And you can hear the cogs in your brain whirring as you're sort of trying to work it all out. And it's, it's an extraordinary idea. And, um, and I wish you all the luck and love with it. And, and honestly, I, I can't thank you enough for, first of all, for, for sending me the email that, that acted as a catalyst for us to do this and for talking so openly. I, I know it can't have been easy to, to sort of talk so freely about it all and, and to go into those sorts of times and memories but um you know th this is this is the thing it's so it's so brilliant for other people to hear these stories and to not feel alone in their own lives with their own life experience um and to hear yeah honest storytelling like this so matt i, I literally can't thank you enough well thanks so much for having me i i get i mean i take a lot of solace from your podcast and i i'm sure people tell you that all the time thank you. um but hearing you speak as honestly as you do about your own struggles and mental health issues, and then hearing all the guests that you have be as um, as forthcoming and as honest as they are, it I, it's incredibly soothing in a way that I really hope you understand what the good that you're doing. It's um, oh, thanks, man. yeah, it's been it's it's been it's an it's an incredible thing to to hear people's vulnerability and to think oh i'm not alone in this and i, I really feel like we're at the the start of the age where people are going to talk more about this and thank god people are talking more about um their 
mental health and it feels so scary to to do it um and yeah i'm just really grateful that you've that you've had me on for a, for a chit chat about it and um oh, the feeling but i really so hope mutual. that i really hope that someone out there goes oh do you know what i have these up phases and these down phases but i don't feel like i've got bipolar maybe i've got cyclothymia because because just knowing what it is the label so helpful for me um and and equally you know anyone who sort of is an alcoholic or has one in their family or has um experienced someone uh, that they love taking their own life I'm, I'm hopeful that they can know that they're not alone and that you know it's uh the, the pain or whatever it is the mixed emotions they're experiencing aren't um aren't just theirs no, without a doubt without a doubt and you know that's that's um exactly why i'm i'm so grateful that you you wanted to talk today so thank you so much matt thanks fern 